Yeah, I saw your online reviews. I've never seen such good reviews for any business online. I mean, it I, I'm very particular about that. I'm very careful about making sure that people who come to this firm, we exceed their expectations. And, and so um, I, we try to hit that bullseye every single time. I like 100% people thrilled with our law firm. And so we go pretty far, as far as we can possibly go to make that happen. And, and same thing with the Better Business Bureau. Nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you, too. I came out to uh, listen to you. Um, I brought my uh, cousin with me when we went out to the university here and we listened to you about uh, pulling people over and what to do, what not to do. I found it very inspiring. I thought it was kind of interesting that you're in the business of helping people with their legal troubles, yet you were out there, I assume you weren't making any money, you were just out there uh, educating people how not to use your services. Yeah, that's true, I do that a lot, actually. <laughs> that's pretty neat. Um, and that makes you very unique. As, but it seems like, you know, looking at your office and everything, that it, the, the, it pays off. I think it does pay off. Um, another way of saying that is we treat people right at our firm. I think there are different approaches to practicing law. Um, some lawyers choose to make more money in the short term, and we could definitely do that. Um, I opt to build a practice thinking long term. And, uh, what I call some old-fashioned values. Good example of that is somebody who comes into my office on a first-time possession of marijuana case in Maricopa County. Uh, unless there's something sort of um, out of the ordinary going on, they're going to get a diversion program. You won't believe the number of times people come in here on those cases and they've got quotes, $8,000, $9,000 from other lawyers to represent them. I don't meet with them for free like the other lawyers do. I charge $100 for what we call a strategy session. I spend a lot of time going through the case, but I tell them that they don't need a lawyer on that type of case. They usually are very surprised by that. And they say, what do you mean? So-and-so has already quoted me, you know, eight, $9,000. And I say, well, if you want to waste money hiring a lawyer, that you can, but um, I'm just telling you the truth is you're going to get a tax diversion program. You don't need a lawyer. There are many cases like that. DUI case is another one that comes to mind very frequently on DUI cases if it's a first time and uh, they're not looking at more than the legal minimum and it looks like they're going to have a very hard case, I tell them, I think you're going to have a tough time defending this case, but here's what you're going to get and I send them away without representation. I know that that might uh, upset some of my fellow defense attorneys and it confuses some people who come in here, but it's the right thing to do. Well, if I understand it, you're sending them away with the information in order to proceed with what's going on with their life at the minimal cost, the minimal headache. It's exactly true. If I think they don't need a lawyer, I tell them that, even in cases where I could get a fee. And the reason I do that is because I think it's in our interest to do that. We don't make money short term, but long term, it builds a reputation, it builds a brand, it builds trust and loyalty and honesty. And so that's how you build a business long term. If I was in um, business for six months and plan to stay in business for maybe a year or so that I you know maybe it makes sense to take the money and uh, do business like that I don't do business like that and having been in business now 24 years I know it pays dividends because I've had people come in here and say Mark you don't remember me but six years ago you sent me away and told me I didn't need a lawyer and you were right even when other lawyers were charging me a fee and now that they've come back that they need something else. I had one guy who said, I always remembered that. I remembered an honest guy and when I ever needed a lawyer I thought I'd come back and now I need a lawyer and I come back and I'm not even interested in talking to anybody else. So um, it pays, it's the right thing to do and it pays dividends long term and so that's just the way we've opted to do business. Long, long term thinking. Long, totally long term thinking. I believe that you build a business based on uh, the boring, old-fashioned things of just doing a good job, be honest with people, tell them the truth, do what you say you're going to do, 
um, the old fashioned ethics. Return phone calls, return emails, anybody who would ever call this firm and say, I can't get a hold of Mark Victor, would be laughed at because everybody knows I return all of my emails and all of my phone calls the same day they are received, even if it's on a Sunday even if it's on New Year's Day or Christmas Day or Thanksgiving Day or Easter or whatever, I'm available all the time, 24-7, 365. Aside from, obviously it's a business, but aside from any financial gains, what kind of personal gains do you get from being a workaholic and being so ambitious and helpful to people in the way that you're describing? Well, you have to start by doing something you like. And um, I like being a lawyer. It's, it's certainly one of my favorite things. Do you like the debate? Yeah, I like to argue. And you I, like to think about it? I like to fight the government. There's lots of things I like about being a lawyer, but I love uh, promoting freedom. And so I've combined the two concepts here at this law firm. We are planning to change the name of the firm from Mark J. Victor PC to Attorneys for Freedom PC because I want this to be more about fighting for freedom. I like, and I'm not shy about the fact that I use my law firm for, for my personal purposes, which is to promote freedom. And so I do everything I can to not be neutral about politics and philosophy and things going on in the world. We, we have a position and I don't try to be everything to everyone. I'm for freedom, and uh, the articles that I write and the speeches that I give, anybody who spent any time looking at those would know that I'm not trying to be um, everything to end everyone. I'm trying to be hardcore, pro-freedom, uh, pro-peace, pro you're in charge of yourself, pro-private property. That's what we're about. You know, you, you, you use freedom a lot, you know, and it's a one-word term where we know that Things are way more complicated than catchphrases and words. Um, define what, what your definition of freedom is. Well, freedom is one of those things that's far more complicated, and, and any definition would be inadequate. But um, to be freedom is the right to be left alone. Freedom is about the right to both define your own happiness and to pursue your own happiness in any way that's peaceful. It's the right to be in charge of yourself, to live and let live, as they say sometimes. And so, of course, the devil is in the details, and we need to determine when one person is uh, trespassing on another person's property. But those are, those are the exception cases. For the most part, it's pretty easy to figure out, right? I mean, it's the rules that your mom taught you when you went to go to kindergarten, right? Uh, don't touch someone else's toys unless you have permission. Keep your hands to yourself, those kinds of things. And I don't think things necessarily have to get a lot more complicated from kindergarten. Those are good rules. I always thought those were good rules. Those are rules we should still uh, be following today. So yeah, there are five percent of the times when it's difficult to determine uh, who's trespassing on who and whether uh, force is used or whether something is coercion, those kinds of things. Yeah, it can be hard. So you don't, you, you're not for the freedom to, to, to be cruel to others. It's more about the freedom if you're peaceful. Well, to live your life out. Being cruel to others gets into a sort of another can of worms. Do I think people have a right to call other people names that might be perceived as cruel? Yes, I do. Uh, so I guess you do have a right to be cruel to others, but you don't have a right to trespass upon other people, to use their property, to take their property, to uh, sort of tell them what to do with their lives. And when I say their property, I mean their body, their money, their time, other items of property that they have peacefully acquired. So I think you have every right uh, to, to take any position you want on any particular issue. You could be a racist jerk if you like, so long as you're peaceful. Um, being a libertarian doesn't mean you have a right to tell other people that they have to take politically correct positions, or they have to be popular, or they have to be kind. Or they have to think like you do. Or they have to, think like <laughs> you, or they have to be polite. All it really is saying is you have to keep your hands to yourself. That's what we're really saying. You have a right to be uh, in charge of yourself. You have a right to control your own property, but you don't have a right to control other people's property. A lot of people think, you know, with the ideas of freedom is, is, is to do something, you know, it allows people to have the choice to do something wrong, 
but you're an attorney for freedom because you want that choice to be open for people to do the right thing. Well, like the, people have a right to, first of all, the right thing and the wrong thing are, are things people can disagree about. Right. Morality is, is something that people always have disagreed about. And it's and, always changing. Well, throughout people have different opinions on what's moral, what's good, and what's bad. And libertarianism doesn't reach that question. We reach the issues of what should be legal and what should be illegal. We don't get to the question of what should be moral and immoral. People have a right um, to be left to their own conscious, conscious, to use their own um, freedom of conscience to decide what's right and what's wrong for them. So I'm not trying to tell people uh, what their morality ought to be or what they ought to decide to be right or wrong or how they ought to run their lives. That is not my business, nor do I uh, want anything to do with that. If somebody asks me what they should do with their life and I'm inclined to give an answer, I guess I would give them an answer. But that's not what I'm fighting for at all. What I'm fighting for is that competent adults ought to, for themselves, decide how to run their own lives. And they should be left alone to do such things. It's only when what they do trespasses on the rights of others that I think they ought to be uh, dealt with or interfered with. And that only ought to be interference by government as the agent of the person who is being interfered with. Okay. Your, you, where, do you, where do you get inspired for your critical thinking, questioning authority, and you know your logical conclusions? That, that, yeah, like. Well, um, I didn't, never heard the word libertarian until I went to law school and met Butler Schaefer, one of my professors there, and he uh, sort of deconstructed the whole thing for me and really got me started down this path. I'm uh, I'm enthusiastic about it, and it's a passion of mine because I believe very strongly that probably 80% of the ills that we deal with in the world are easily resolved. We have, we are creating our own problems and then the same people that have created the problems are now trying to posit solutions for us. If we just adopted a free society and we allow capitalism and freedom to do their thing, we wouldn't have these problems. Standards of living would rise. And uh, I also believe that uh, our health care crisis is just as much a function of the government feeding us misinformation about what's healthy and unhealthy for us to put in our bodies. I think people now eat with reckless disregard for their health. And why should they? Because they are able to subsidize those bad costs, the big costs of eating as poorly as they do onto other people. If people had to take responsibility for their own health care and maybe pay for their own health care, maybe there'd be a percentage of people who spent a little bit more time thinking about what they're actually ingesting and going to get some exercise and being preventative about what is wrong with our bodies rather than just simply reactive. I mean, we have such an epidemic of obesity because we eat nothing but processed food, fast food, high sugar foods, high carbs, and we get fat. And then we have the accompanying health problems that now the government, uh, which has a give, which gave us the, the food pyramid and all the wrong information at the beginning about what we should be eating. And if you look at public schools, they get pizza and soda and candy. The same government that's feeding our kids the junk that they're eating is now trying to present solutions for the health care mess that we're in. Maybe we could solve both problems by getting the government out. Well, from my perspective, what I just heard is that they created the problem and they're offering solutions that not really ultimately help the problem but make it work. Like so many of these problems, right? Yeah. So, it's, so it's, many of the military issues we've got, the war and peace issues around the world are created by the government and now they pause it to solve them. The economic issues were created by the government and now, I mean, look, we're off. The, we don't. We have fiat money. We have money that's not connected to anything. We have paper money that the government just prints as much or little of it as it wants. We've completely turned over the, our economy to the government, including the money supply. Shame on us for not paying attention. Well, the government took us off the gold standard and forced everybody into 
uh, government schools, or the most kids into government schools, and how it has taken over the health care system. And you know, the more and more things that government takes over, the more and more problems that we find. Maybe we ought to look and say, instead of looking to government for the solution, maybe we ought to do what Ronald, Dr. Ronald Reagan said, government is the problem. Government is the problem, not the solution. And yet, um, it, it appears in many areas we're still going in the wrong direction there. Although I'm optimistic long term, I think people are starting to figure out um, that really, uh, like for example on the drug war, people are starting to figure out that, that marijuana needs to be legal and soon we'll move into other drugs as well. Uh, people are starting to figure out the gay marriage thing, really do we care that much about boys kissing. Um, so there are lots of things now that people are starting to become more civilized, I would say, just more in line in the sort of concept of tolerance, that we should, as free humans, tolerate the rights of other people to live their lives however they want, as long as they're peaceful. That's a libertarian concept, and in a lot of ways, we're moving in the right direction. We need to identify it and say, this is libertarian, this is pro-freedom, this is pro-capitalism. Well, I think different things appeal to different people. I think there are some libertarians who would say, using the political mechanisms to promote freedom is a waste of time, but yet you're a living example of Ron Paul, who used the political mechanisms as a microphone to get out there and talk about libertarian concepts, and in, in your case, it worked. And so I think for some people, political action makes sense, for some people, writing makes sense, for some people, arguing or doing other things makes sense. I don't know what's going to touch my fellow human beings and inspire them to be more libertarian, but I like the multifaceted approach. Let's let different people do different things and try different experiments to try to move the hearts and minds in a more freedom, more peace type of a direction. Whatever, wherever, whatever gets us in that direction is what I'm in favor. But do you think those people are a, a, a small fraction of society in your 20 years of being a defense attorney, or do you think the larger majority of the population would be a little more responsible or respecting other people's freedoms? Well, it's an interesting question. On I've noticed in my time on the planet that on a one-on-one -on -one level, human to human, most people act mostly libertarian. Most people get the idea that they don't reach and steal somebody's wallet out of their pocket or when someone's invited into someone's house, probably they recognize it's bad form to take their property and walk out the front door. Kind of like the golden rule kind of thing? Most people act mostly libertarian on a one-to-one -one basis. We do have an extreme minority of people who just like to violate the rights of other people and we have to deal with them in a criminal justice system. But for some reason, when uh, we, we use the word government and we have this fiction and uh, that there's this sort of greater concept of government and when people en masse start voting to use the property of other people, they don't perceive that the same way. Somehow uh, a theft that's normally not permitted becomes permitted as long as the majority of people agree to steal. I don't agree with that. I think theft is theft and theft remains theft even if the majority of people agree, even if uh, part of the proceeds of the theft will be used for good purposes, uh, feeding starving children somewhere in the world, and even if some of them are eventually returned to the person who is stolen from, none of that justifies a theft. A theft is a theft, and it's a theft whether it happens at the point of a gun or a point of a voting booth. Either one, they're theft to me. It doesn't change the concept of theft, and I'm against theft. I'm against trespass. I'm against fraud. Yeah, I have had a, a friend who, you know, uh, would have these kind of values, you know, we should ban guns, but we should also pay for education and we should do all this. In other words, she expected that uh, everyone should just be for charity and her form of charity was to send money to the central planner and then have them decide how to do the charity. I found it to be more rewarding to do it by choice. Well, people who take these types of positions and say, well, I think we ought to you know, uh, pay for people's higher education or something like that, I always say, well, feel free to send yeah. your money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, well, they're, not, they're not really, they're saying something different. They're not right. really saying, I think we ought to fund this or that. What they're saying is, 
I think I ought to be able to get other people who don't want to fund such things <laughs> to, through the force and coercive mechanisms of government to get them to fund the things that I have decided are important. But I don't think anyone has a right to spend anybody else's money. Period. It just comes down to that. I, I understand there are the good arguments. People may say, Mark, I think you should spend your money on this, that, and the next thing, and here's why, and all these reasons. They have every right to try to persuade me to spend my money on things, as I do with other people, no problem. But at the end of the day, if somebody has persuaded me, or failed to persuade me, or I failed to persuade someone else in terms of how they should spend their money, I think that ought to be the end of it. I don't get to then force them to spend their money in ways that I think are more important than the owner of the money thinks. That doesn't make sense to me, and that is not compatible with what I think a free society is about. A free society is about people being in charge of themselves and their own bodies and their own money. So uh, I don't think we ought to all be in charge of each other's money. That doesn't, that strikes me as a socialist concept, not a capitalist concept. Okay, with that, uh Capitalism. A lot of a lot of times, I hear that the problem with our current economic system is that we live in a capitalist society. My point of view is that looking at it objectively, you know, most countries around the world are mixed in socialism and capitalism. Well, when you, they're, they're all mixed bags. Um, and I would just say it like this, capitalism is the economic system that is compatible with a free society because capitalism recognizes the right, uh, acknowledges the right of the owner of the money to make decisions about to trade or not to trade. That's called the free market. And so the free market capitalism is what's consistent with what I'm talking about in terms of a free society. Um, but I don't know why this is still a, set, a source of confusion for people. Yeah, I don't either. It seems to me that wherever you look all over the world, if you find a freer economic uh, system, like here, we have a mixed bag of capitalism and socialism, but we have more capitalism than other places. And so to the extent you have capitalism and to the extent you have a free society, you have a higher standard of living. I don't know how many times we need to look at the same situation. We can look at East Germany and West Germany, right? We can take the same, exact same group of people in the exact same geographic area, chop it in half and uh, seal them up and then open them up after a period of several decades and let's just see how they're doing. If you're interested in raising standards of living, freedom and capitalism gets that done. That's the reason why, in my opinion, the United States is the world's superpower. It's not because we're luckier or we love our children or we have some special work ethic or anything like that. It's because we've had more freedom relative to other countries and so because we've, had, we've done a better job with capitalism and we've kept uh, church and state relatively separate and we've done a better job allowing people to start businesses and invest their money and control less of the economy through the wasteful mechanisms of government than other countries, we've done better. I think we could do much better than we've done so far. I think we could have even more capitalism and more freedom and raise standards of living even more. And uh, how would that how would that be? I mean, if it, the way that you envision it, how could we raise the, the standard of living because that's a big concern amongst everybody you know in our country right well freedom does that the issue is how do we get there and I believe that the best way to get there is in fact I would say the only way to get there is to win hearts and minds we've got to convince more people that they ought to uh, take libertarian principles and, and live them and you sort of um, love freedom and uh, not love coercion. And to say, you know what, even though I want to get something done and I might be able to get it done by coercing my neighbor, I'm not going to do that. I am repulsed by the concept that uh, I have to use force to get things that I want in my life. And I don't feel that way. I don't feel like I need to coerce anybody to do anything ever. I feel like in, I can get along in the world just fine making voluntary agreements with my fellow human beings and there's no reason I need to be able to coerce anybody into anything. I want to be left alone. I don't want people coercing me, but I don't feel that me repelling another person's trespass upon me is me doing something improper. That's self-defense. And so we just need more people to internalize in their hearts and in their minds freedom and, and give up on this sort of big brother paternalistic stuff that has really 
um, sent our country in the wrong direction. All we need is freedom. That's what the founding fathers of our country were intending to set up. They were all of one mind, but they understood that self-ownership was important and sort of bottom-up thinking was more important than sort of top-down, tyrannical type governments imposing laws and rules and regulations on everyone. So I think we need to get back to our roots and get back to the concept of a free society. And that, that means winning hearts and minds. Okay. And that means actually respecting the freedoms of others, and it's not the ones that, that not, take care of. Absolutely. You have to be big enough to respect the rights of other people to do things that you don't approve of but that are peaceful. And until we can get there, we're not making any progress in terms of a free society. There's a tagline, it's called uh, taxation is theft. And of course, being a small little tagline, it can have different meanings for uh, many different people. What is, uh, what is your thoughts on this taxation is theft idea? Well, I don't think taxation is theft. Um, theft is the taking of another person's property without their consent. So you, you think that it's not theft? Yeah, I think taxation is not theft because taking uh, theft is taking a person's money without their permission. Um, I think it would be much more accurate to say that taxation is robbery because robbery involves the threat of force. And so taxes involve the taking of another person's property with the threat of force, that if you don't give up the taxes, the government or someone is going to come to your house and knock your door down and take your property without your permission. That's more akin to a robbery or at least a threat of force. So um, I think it's more accurate to say taxes Taxation is robbery rather than taxation is theft. Okay, okay. That makes a lot of sense. In other words, we're making it sound too palatable when we say taxation is theft. Taxation is robbery, and we need to be clear about what it is. I think it's wrong to take someone's money, to take someone's property with the threat of force. Okay. It's a classic robbery definition to me. It's only good that Thomas Jefferson and Sam Adams and John Adams can't see the pathetic state of affairs in the United States while we shoot off our fireworks and celebrate the great freedoms to be taxed at the horrible rates that we're taxed at and to have everything regulated and prohibited and mandatory and have a system where if you drive a car down the street, any police officer at any time can pull you over for almost any reason. You can be interfered with and messed with by the government almost any time. Shame on us that we have allowed our government to get so many tens of trillions of dollars in debt and that the discussion about health care now completely omits the most important argument, which is why on earth should the government be forcing one person to pay for the health care of another person if they don't want to? And now both the Republicans and the Democrats have embarrassingly agreed to the concept that the government can force everybody to pay for everyone else's health care. It's embarrassing and it's unworthy of a free society. So shame on us. But we're at $20 trillion in debt. Our debt has exceeded our GDP in a year. And when I try to tell people we can't afford it, they no, we live in a It's not even a matter of if we can afford it. Maybe we could afford it just fine. It would still be wrong to force people to pay for the health care or the hamburgers or the shoes or the education of another person if they didn't want to. Sorry, yeah. that's just the nature of the Where, where does it end? You can pay for my car and my house. And I think if you want else. something, then you should pay for it. If you can't afford for it, you can go to charity and see if you can get it that way. If not, then you should do without it, or you should work until you can afford it, or buy insurance or something like that. There's many different options out there. But if somebody can't afford something, to me, it doesn't mean that they have a right to get into someone else's pocket to force their neighbor to pay for their things that they want. Okay. We're set up in a society where, by design, we're, we're almost um, trained to be in these redundant arguments where it goes around and around, you know. Yeah, but the, the government now controls most of the education of children by running the public schools, and so the government teaches what the government wants students to know. Be a good citizen, uh, you know, salute the flag, um, pay your taxes, do what you're supposed to, think inside the box, 
these are the rules, your job is to follow them. And so um, I think it was a terrible mistake to let the government run our school system. I think school systems ought to be, uh, the education of children ought to be left to the parents of those children so they can decide how they want their kids educated and what they want them educated in. That's life in a free society. And yes, there are lots of things that uh, people don't like about free societies. Could some bad parents pick bad educational schemes for their kids? Yes, they could. But that's life in a free society. But you're not forced to that. I'm not a utopian libertarian. I don't yeah. think that we're going to get utopia. I just think the world would be better with people making their own decisions about their own bodies and their own money and their own property, rather than a one-size-fits-all, uh, majority-driven government solution. Is there like a philosophy or an importance that you see in, in having a society of uh, our constitutional right to bear arms? I don't fault people in a free society who opt not to have guns. They have every right to not have a gun, just like a business has every right to put a sign up that says no guns allowed. And then we as consumers have every right to opt to go there or not to go there based on their policy. So. Freedom doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's going to go out and be a gun owner. It means that competent, peaceful people who choose to be a gun owner can then go out and then competently and peacefully keep their firearm. That's what makes sense to me. It doesn't mean that uh, we have to have some push to get everybody to have a gun anymore. That it means that if, if marijuana is legalized, that everybody needs to go out and smoke marijuana. I think uh, people who hate marijuana could advocate consistently that marijuana ought to be legal and also say I don't think anybody should smoke marijuana it's a bad thing and I don't do it and I recommend other people don't do it see nothing inconsistent with that I have a good friend who's a very religious Christian and he, he's a libertarian and he takes the position that um, prostitution is immoral and it's bad and he thinks it's a sin and he tries to discourage anybody he could from uh, not being involved in a life of prostitution but he's also a very firm, equally firm, in terms of legalization of prostitution. He feels both that it's a sin and it should be discouraged, as well as it ought to be perfectly legal for people who ought, ought uh, to be in a life of prostitution. That's what freedom is about, and it's perfectly fine. We need to embrace the idea that we can be big adults now. It's time for us to be adults in the United States and say, you know what? I'm for the rights of other people to do things that I don't do myself and that I don't agree with, but I, because I'm for freedom, I respect their right to do it peacefully. When we can get there, then we deserve a free society. Until then, we're like a bunch of whining babies looking to the government to give us another link on our chain. I guess I'm just trying to boil it down for those people that quite pervert this idea of freedom. You know, they misunderstand the great value in it. And I think, for me, the value in it is if I'm living my life peaceful, I should be left alone. I think everyone should agree with that. I think you it's know? a very important point, and um, people who are concerned only about the freedoms that they personally enjoy, to me, aren't really freedom activists at all. And I make this point all the time. When I talk to the pro-marijuana people, I like to talk to them about uh, that they're for marijuana and that they smoke marijuana isn't so impressive to me. Um, it's not really a good thing. It doesn't, well, I mean, doesn't okay. fully benefit I'm happy you 100%. I'm happy for their, that they're for legalized marijuana, but mm -hmm. that don't strike me as a, much of a freedom person unless they're for something that they don't do. Uh, like, for example, I like to ask the marijuana people how they feel about gay rights. I like to ask the gay crowd how they feel about marijuana smoking. I like to ask the gun crowd about how they feel about other things. I like to ask the gay crowd how they feel about guns. So the issue isn't, uh, we need to get away from this concept of we're only trying to promote and fight for the freedoms that we personally enjoy. We need to be bigger than that. We need to get to the point of, do we fight and defend the rights of other people to do things that we don't do, or even better, uh, things that, while still peaceful, are uh, we find immoral, unhealthy, wrong, uh, bad, unwise, something like that. Do you, are you big enough to stand up for the rights of other competent adults to do those peaceful but 
in your estimation, unwarranted things. If you can do that, then I see you as a as a freedom activist. Okay. It's kind of like the uh, person who's pro-gun, but they don't understand how the same basic concept of why they think they should, could have a gun and, and use it appropriately and be responsible with that weapon doesn't understand the drug laws or the problems with our current I, I, I think, in the case of guns, I think competent adults ought to be um, free to have whatever weapon they want, so long as they're competent with that weapon and they can store that weapon in a way that doesn't endanger other people. Um, I don't see what the issue is. Free people ought to be left alone so long as they're peaceful and safe and don't pose risks to other people. If, uh, you know, some guy who's drunk and reckless walking down the street with a gun, I will not necessarily respect that person's right uh, to pull out their firearm and start waving it around. They're not competent at that point. So um, it's the same with all these things. You know, I, that's why I don't reach the issue of whether or not marijuana is harmful or not, because it doesn't matter to me. Competent adults get to put things in their body even if they're harmful. We do that all the time, right? Alcohol is pretty harmful. I think uh, red meat is harmful. I think dairy is harmful. Cigarettes. Cigarettes are harmful. Lots of things are harmful. I don't think the purpose of life is to avoid things that are harmful or unhealthy. And I certainly don't think that's the purpose of government to keep us away from things that are unhealthy. I think competent adults have a right to control their own bodies, and that includes the right to put unhealthy or unwise things into their body. Well, what do you think about the um, solution that we currently have in our country to deal with these problems of addiction? We don't have any such solutions that I'm aware of. Political solutions aren't really solutions. Um, and the problem of addiction really is a function of the person who's the addict, um, that somebody else thinks uh, another person has a problem with a substance isn't really relevant to me. If, um, you know, there are some people who think that, uh, you know, someone who might smoke marijuana has a problem, is automatically an addict. Well, if the person who's smoking marijuana is a competent adult and they're running their lives and they're not bothering anybody, I don't see that the law ought to be involved at all. Maybe a friend might tap them on the shoulder and say, I think you have a problem, but the person is still free to ignore that. If they're not bothering anybody, they should have a right to be left alone. Freedom is about the right to be left alone, so long as you're peaceful. And I don't have any issue with that. In terms of you know, addictions, yes, there's lots of people with lots of addictions. Um, I think that if we wanted to take a stab at having fewer people addicted to drugs, we could certainly end the drug war and make it much easier for people who are addicted and who want help with such addictions to come forward without fear that they're going to be helped by putting, being thrown into a cage like an animal for possibly many years of their life. Who, who benefits from you know, our war on drugs? Who, who there ultimately are, benefits? There are many people who benefit from the war on drugs. For starters, all the drug dealers benefit from the war on drugs. The cartel benefits from the war on drugs. I get to talk to drug dealers all the time. I have frank conversations with them all the time. And I ask them about the drug war, and every single one of them uh, would like the drug war to continue, because they all know that if the drug war ended, so would their profession in terms of being an illegal drug dealer. So they benefit. People who are in law enforcement, people who are in the prison system, and benefit from more bodies being collected and then processed through the system and uh, ultimately parked in, in jail. And are you suggesting like a cash cow kind of situation? Well, there, look, it's a big business. Running the drug war is a big business. There's $69 billion in it the last time I looked annually, and that grows all the time. And so the people who are benefiting from that money obviously want to keep the drug war in place, but they're making money off of the backs of putting uh, peaceful people in prison, and I think that's disgusting. Which is one of the reasons that I'm for ending the drug war. I'm also ending for lots of business that comes into this law firm, right? We get a lot of work from people who are charged with drug crimes. I'm willing to give every single bit of it up to end the drug war because freedom is more important than money, period. It seems like uh, I've heard statistics where the much larger majority of the people in prison are, are in there over nonviolent crimes. And when I mix that in with the private prison complex that has taken over our country, 
it's kind of a scary concept if you know well it is especially where we have this lunatic attorney general um sessions now who is trying to ramp up the drug war yeah right i mean that that is scary i think that's outrageous i think that it's very difficult to be the land of the free while you're the land of the incarcerated so we should be embarrassed at the incarceration rates in our country uh, it's an emergency to get our fellow peaceful brothers and sisters out of prison and to end the drug war immediately. To me, that this is an emergency. It's a crisis. It's something that needs to end immediately. A lot of people are in this mind frame. We got one side of this good question. Let's solve the gun problem by making guns disappear. We'll just crack down on anyone who has a gun. And it's the same, it seems like that's how they're dealing with the drugs. Let's just make the drugs disappear. And it seems like to me that both of those issues, their solutions, creating way more of a problem. Yeah, I mean, these are failed uh, efforts. It's like trying to pass a law that says, you know, let's just make the crime disappear. It just life doesn't work like that. And so um, both of these are failed. The drug war has been a colossal, by any measure, asking any person, I don't know how anybody could conclude anything other than the drug effort that this country has engaged in since the late 60s has been a complete, total, 100% failure. It hasn't stopped anybody from using drugs, it hasn't curbed addiction, it hasn't stopped the crime, it has done nothing but create a black market industry and blurred the lines about what it means to be free. People don't understand what it means to be free. We're great at singing songs about freedom. We, we love to jump up and down and clap our hands and shoot our fireworks on July 4th. But you don't have freedom if competent adults aren't in charge of their own bodies. So for all those people who love to celebrate the 4th of July and also are for the drug war, I would say they have no concept of freedom. They're confused and they're an embarrassment to America. If America is the land of the free, the land of the free in a drug war are just simply completely and totally incompatible. Also, the people who want to ban guns, simply banning guns in a free country, those two things don't go together. Making sure that people are responsible with guns, making sure that people who aren't competent can't have guns to the extent we can even do that, and I'm not really sold that we can do very much in that area, but I don't have any problems with laws that prevent incompetent people uh, from having guns, people who, that try to prevent people who are violent and have shown that they can't play well with others away from guns, fantastic. But we need to deal with the reality that such people still get guns. Just because we pass a law outlawing something like murder, for example, we've had laws in the books uh, making murder illegal, we still have murders. We need to recognize that bad guys will still get guns. And, and we all know the way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. They don't just go away. We can't you know, wish them away. We can't ask them to stop shooting and killing people. It's very difficult to um, you know, hope that you're gonna get a baseball bat and stop somebody with a gun. The way to stop them with a gun is to get a gun and shoot them and stop them from killing other people. And so I like the fact, and I like the idea that competent, peaceful adults have guns. I wish more competent, peaceful adults had guns out in society so when the bad idiots with guns show up, we can stop them more readily. I was taught we live in a democracy Way to get rid of way to get rid of gun violence. Get rid of guns. I believe that. Moved out here. It took me about three, four, five years, maybe even longer, before I realized the big difference. Now I'm in the the least restrictive state. You know, and um, there's a lot less violence. I feel a lot safer in this in this state. Um, well, I mean, I think it's good to come to Arizona. I mean, we had some exchange students here from Poland not too long ago gun ownership is completely foreign to them. But I said, you know, here you can, if you're a resident, you can go buy a, an assault rifle, and I know that's not the proper term for the AR-15, but right. that's the term that the press has used. You can buy one of the big, scary assault rifles, and uh, you can pay cash, and you can not fill out one piece of paperwork, and not have a background check, and not have a waiting period. And um, That's incredible that some people don't even realize that. And yet, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't cause any problems at all. You come to Arizona, you won't feel any less safe than you feel in uh, Washington, D.C. or Illinois, where they have all these restrictive gun laws. And, and in fact, uh, we can pretty conclusively show that the gun violence is much higher in the states that have the more restrictive gun laws. That doesn't surprise me at all. The issue isn't the gun. 
The issue is the disposition of the person who is carrying the gun. The gun isn't a problem. Well, and then, and then when you talk about different political philosophies and different, um, uh, like socialism, capitalism, different forms of economics, isn't the most important thing kind of like, uh, uh, I'm going to branch off on just what you said, it, it isn't so much the system or the tools, it's the people who are, who are implementing Well, I think that's how you get the system. I think that if you just change more heart, hearts and minds and more people here were for freedom, the system would necessarily change. And with freedom, I understand you can't just, you can't include freedom without responsibility. Of course. Of course. We don't think you people know. should just uh, be able to do whatever they want. I mean, when, when I talk about freedom, you don't have a right to do anything you want. You have a right to do anything you want with your property. So if you own a brick and I own a window, that doesn't mean you get to do anything you want with your brick by throwing it through my window because you're doing something with my window, right? But if you own the brick and you own something else, you can do whatever you want with those two things. That's your business. And so if you're not interfering with another person, that's fine. So um, look, a free society is more moral. A free society works better. A free society is more easily, uh, I think, managed. It leads less administration. A free society raises standards of living. It's not best for the government, but uh, it's not best for those who are uh, profit from a police state. But for the rest of us, it's a much better system.